This is Radio Equal Shock with your host, Alex Smith. Oh yes, the heat is definitely on. Alaska just experienced the warmest spring ever. The permafrost is thawing at an accelerated pace. Experts say that's due to anomalous warm summers, like it's been strangely hot in the Arctic or something. In fact, this level of permafrost thaw was not expected until the year 2090. Global warming is just 70 years early. CNN reports Greenland, quote, lost 2 billion tons of ice yesterday, which is very unusual, end quote. June has been a record for ice loss in Greenland, which will speed up sea level rise. Meanwhile, this headline from GulfNews.com. Kuwait and Saudi Arabia record highest temperature on Earth. The heat wave is expected to continue well into the summer season. You and I know that won't slow down oil sales from the Middle East, just as Canada keeps mining the tar sands while our temperature doubles, and Australia wants to expand their coal as they roast out. The renewables revolution has begun. There are world's biggest solar farms popping up in the Middle East and China. But renewables cannot possibly save us unless we stop producing fossil fuels on an emergency basis. Just pretend we have declared war on the planet. What can we do to save ourselves, our kids, and the other species? Radio EcoShock. More people will die from heat as the world warms. It could be you or someone you know. A new study tries to tell us how many more people will die in 15 major American cities according to how hot we make it. The lead author is Dr. Eunice Lowe. She is a research associate in the Climate Dynamics Group at the University of Bristol in the UK. Eunice Lowe, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, why did you and your team of 12 authors decide to investigate heat deaths, and why choose the United States instead of the UK or some other place? Yeah, so we have decided to estimate heat-related mortality in the future associated with global warming because, you know, human lives and well-being is a lot more relatable to us. And instead of looking at how much warmer a place is going to be in the future, we are now able to look at how many people and how many people's lives could be affected by a sudden temperature. And we think that will be a good indicator of future climate policy making. We've decided to look at the US because obviously there are many people living in the United States and there are major cities in the United States, which is the biggest economy in the world. Also, the United States is the one nation that has announced pulling out of the International Paris Agreement. So we want to assess the impact of actually limiting or achieving the goals in the Paris Agreement would have on people uh, living in major U.S. cities. And the other reason is that we do need reliable health and temperature data um, in the observations in a, in a historical period. And we have a lot more reliable data in the United States than many other places in the world. Well, that makes sense. And you emphasize the need to talk about heat mortality on a city-by-city basis. Please talk about the important differences in U.S. cities when it comes to dying from the heat. Yeah, so we've decided to look at heat-related mortality on a city level because the relationship between daily temperatures and mortality risk is very different from city to city, even within the same country. And that's because these cities all have different climates. So people living in these cities are used to different ranges of temperatures. And so the mortality risk at a certain temperature will be different between the cities. And also the population structures are very different across the cities. For example, if a place has more elderly people who are aged 65 or above, these people are most vulnerable to heat than the other age groups. And so depending on the population structure or demography of a city, um, the mortality risk or the vulnerability of these cities uh, will be very different. So it's important to look at the city level rather than a bigger region. 
You know, some scientists and institutions say we are heading towards at least three degrees C of warming by the year 2100. Why didn't the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change work out that three degree scenario in their recent special report? So I think the the recent report on one and a half degrees specifically looks at the impacts between or the differences of impacts between the two targets within the Paris Agreement. So that's one and a half and two degrees. And I think the goal of the Paris Agreement is to achieve these targets, right? So that's why we've looked at the differences or, or other studies have looked at the differences in terms of impacts between these two targets. And the goal is to get there from where we are now. You used a relatively simple model for the new study. What are some of the assumptions your team made? Yeah, so we have made a few assumptions in our study, including assuming a constant population in all of our warming scenarios at the historical level. And that's because we want to isolate the impact of climate change in our study, rather than, you know, including other assumptions of population growth and so on. So the differences in the estimated heat-related depth between the different worlds of warming of one and a half, two degrees and three degrees are only due to the differences in temperature uh, in the future, but not other factors. We have also assumed no adaptation in the future, which is a strong assumption. But again, we wouldn't know how much adaptation there will be in the future. So it would also be an assumption if we would put relatively random adaptation scenario in it. So we've decided to keep all of these factors the same and to just isolate the impact of climate change on human mortality. What is a 30-year return period for extreme heat and why did your study use that? So a 1 in 30-year heat event is an event that comes back every 30 years on average. So it is not an event that one might expect to happen every year or every other year, but every 30 years. So it is a relatively rare event, and we've chosen to study this return period because obviously we're interested in extreme events, and a 30-year return period is rarer and more extreme than an event that happens every year. And also we think this period is more relevant to climate policy making and also adaptation measures. So I think some of the journalists who covered your paper might have gotten this wrong because they said that the the sort of peak of deaths that could happen would happen every year, and, and really you're saying they might happen every 30 years. Yeah, some people got it wrong because it is a one in 30-year event, and so the number of deaths that we're talking about are the total number of heat-related deaths in a certain year. But that year doesn't happen every year. That year happens every 30 years. You know, I think some people are confused by the one, as in the annual number, being that it happens every year. But it's, we're talking about an annual number of heat-related deaths that is associated with an extreme event that happens every 30 years. Well, that's what I thought. But I do have a problem with you choosing that for your paper because it seems like we're getting record extreme heat Almost every year, or at least very often, much uh, faster than 30 years. We just had over 50 degrees in India. The American West Coast is uh, in triple digits right now. So uh, I wonder whether that's going to be really valid as a way of forecasting the future. So so you mean it, it seems like we're having a record, you know, extreme events every year? Well, very often, much, much sooner than every 30 years. Yes, I think you're right. And When we look at a one in 30 year event, so that's the definition of an extreme heat happening every 30 years. But the temperature associated with these events are different in different worlds. And I would think that, you know, for any adaptation measures or developing, you know, urban planning in the future, those are associated with longer timeframes than every year. So that's the decision we've come on to and to choose the 30 year return period. We have actually studied return periods from one year to up to 900 years, but we've just only chosen the 30-year return period as an example to highlight our results. Right, but this is one of the problems with science when we look back at our climate, and, and you could go 900 years, but 
the climate is changing so rapidly that it's difficult to use the past analog to predict the future, in my opinion. Well, I'm not sure how I can comment on that. It's just a problem that I think science has to look at, climate science now, because the climate is changing so rapidly. But let's move on. I mean, could you explain for our listeners some of the conclusions from your paper on substantial heat-related mortality in U.S. cities? Our main result is that if we increase our climate ambition to achieve the one and a half degrees target within the Paris Agreement, then hundreds to thousands of heat-related deaths could be avoided per city during an extreme event. And an extreme event is defined being an event that happens every 30 years. So it, it is essential because currently we are on track to about three degrees warming on the global level. And this is this level of warming is implied by our current climate pledges within the Paris Agreement. So there's really urgent need for us to increase our climate pledges in the Paris Agreement to get to the one and a half degree target in order to prevent large increases in heat-related deaths in the future. Eunice, prior to this paper, you published two works about using sulfates in the atmosphere as (laughs) geoengineering to cool the planet. Do you think that can work? I think in, in the literature, there has been research about, you know, how feasible this technology is compared to many other technologies that have been proposed to cool the climate. So injecting sulfate aerosols into the upper atmosphere can potentially cool the global surface relatively quickly within a few years. But there are a lot of considerations that one has to take when considering using this technology. For example, if we start injecting sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere to cool the climate, we have to do it consistently and for a long time. Otherwise, the climate will return to the original state, non-cooled state, very rapidly when we stop doing the injections. And that rate of warming is a lot faster than the rate of global warming we're expecting now. So that high rate of global warming will affect our lives more than, you know, the current rate of warming or the rate that we're expecting in the future. I personally don't think we should inject sulfate aerosols to the atmosphere now because there are so many unknowns associated with this technology. We know some consequences of doing so. For example, it will deplete the ozone layer. It will change many of the things in the climate system. And it will also affect how plants grow, for example. And also there's a huge concern of that when we stop doing this technology, when we stop using this technology, then the temperature will go up really fast faster than the current rate of global warming. And it's also, there's a cost associated with it. There are lots of questions in terms of governance and in terms of who should decide whether we should inject aerosols to control the climate and who should decide to stop it. And also the consequences are just going to be transboundary, affecting different parts of the world differently. So I'm against using this technology right now, but I do think research is needed to look at technologies like that in case we get to a point where we think it's better to take the risk of developing or deploying such technologies. Get all our previous programs at our website, ecoshock.org. This is Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith with my guest from the Climate Dynamics Group at the University of Bristol, Eunice Lowe. We are talking about new science on heat deaths in American cities as the world warms. We think that somewhere between 40 and 70,000 people died in 2003 in Europe in the heat wave then, and an estimated 56,000 Russians died in the 2010 heat wave. Do such high numbers in a single year endanger the statistics produced by your model? Well, I think um, the methods we've used in our paper are robust and many studies in epidemiology have used this modeling technique to estimate the mortality risk associated with temperatures under global warming. And we've also used dedicated climate modeling scenarios to project temperatures in the future. I believe we've used state-of-the-art methods in terms of modeling in our paper. 
but obviously we're looking at city level mortality in our study, and we're also looking at differences between roads that are one and a half and two degrees in the future, and I think those will affect the numbers in our study compared to what has been observed in the real world in past extreme events. The U.S. government, we know, is retracting climate controls, but city governments continue climate action. They are sort of leading the nation from below. Your new paper will give those mayors and councils more information to help keep voters on board with local climate action. Was that part of your goal as well? Yes, it was. We basically know that temperatures are going to rise under global warming. That's the definition of global warming. And we also know that heat waves are going to be more frequent and more severe in many places in the world. But I think really estimating the numbers of deaths per city between different levels of warming that are the targets within the Paris Agreement or where we are currently headed will give a strong motivation to local governments and nations and also nations around the world to really increase their climate action to achieve the Paris Agreement goal. Covering your new paper, both the New York Times and The Guardian in the UK gave headlines more to the coming heat deaths rather than the lives that could be saved with climate action. At least that was my impression. Are you more hopeful about the way your study can be used? So I've chosen to estimate the deaths that could be avoided by limiting global warming rather than estimate the extra deaths that would happen if we, you know, let global warming continue to hit the three degree mark because I think it is hopeful. Like we have we still have a chance to increase climate action to reach the one and a half degree goal. But this window of opportunity is closing really fast. So I chose to put it this way of the benefits or the public health benefits of limiting global warming in order to give hope, you know, to policymakers and tell them, actually, you still have some time to act. And if you act now, then this will be the benefits to the public health. There's a lot of good news science coming out about the way heat is changing as the world warms. In my June 5th Radio EcoShock show, I interviewed Dr. Jane Baldwin of Princeton about her paper, and their team found back-to-back heat waves are a new development since the year 2000. And I wonder, that may not be covered in your baseline climate, which I think ran from 1987 to 2000. So there may be new discoveries that, in fact, increase the number of future heat deaths, do you think? Yeah, I think if we had a longer historical period of daily temperature and mortality that we could have used, then the results will be, you know, maybe slightly different because our results are based on health models that were developed with the data from 1987 to 2000. And if the period that we included in our study included more extreme heat events, for example, then our models would have been more accurate in terms of estimating the mortality risk associated with very high temperatures, which currently we do not have because temperatures that we are projecting in a three-degree world in the future, for example, are beyond the historically observed maximum temperature during the 1987 to 2000 period. So a longer and more reliable observed data of health and also you know, the climate would be very helpful in this kind of study. Well, there's always more work to be done along those lines. Uh, Another question about projected heat deaths is dependence on air conditioning in many American cities. AC is almost total in the south. But if the grid goes down due to the heat or any other reason, wouldn't heat deaths possibly multiply greatly? So you mean if air conditioning goes down? Right. I mean, I think your study presumes that air conditioning will remain in place as it is now. Yes. So air conditioning is obviously one of the ways of reducing exposure to extreme heat at home or at work. So, yeah, we have assumed that the accessibility of households and people in these United States cities to air conditioning to remain the same in the future. So if this changes or this increases or decreases in the future, then the number of heat-related deaths would change in the future. So this means that based on this study, if for some places in the United States where air conditioning is not that available, 
if the air conditioning is made a lot more available in the future as an adaptation measure, then these large increases in heat-related deaths could be avoided as well. Yes, yes, like establishing cooling centers in cities have uh, cut down heat deaths in some places. You can tell from the tone of my questions that I'm worried that the number of future heat deaths in this paper are extremely conservative. And I think you, in fact, uh, do say that because there there's so many large factors in play and, and there are climate surprises already underway. Isn't it a bit dangerous when science underestimates the risk? I think in some sense, our estimates are conservative. For example, we haven't considered a growing population or an aging population, both of which will increase vulnerability or, you know, at least the number of people exposed to extreme heat in the future. But we also haven't considered future adaptation measures, which will hopefully be in place after reading this study and also will reduce the number of heat-related mortality in the future. You know, it's hard to say whether these estimates are conservative or aggressive because we just haven't considered many things or many factors that will change in the future that will affect our results. Well, I always think it's a good sign when a new paper stimulates a lot of questions. Eunice, what are you working on now and what are questions you would like to see answered? So I'm currently looking at the urban heat island effect, which is when urban areas are a lot warmer than the surrounding suburban or rural area because of the different building materials in an urban area and also the limited sky view due to high-rise buildings in an urban area. So we haven't studied or particularly considered the urban heat island effect in our current study because the climate model we used didn't have that high a resolu- spatial resolution to represent structures or microclimates within a city. But with newer climate model projections, I'm hoping to look at how the urban heat island effect would change in the future and also how that would then affect human health and mortality within cities. From the University of Bristol, we've been speaking with Dr. Eunice Lowe. You can find links to this new paper on heat deaths in American cities according to climate action in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Thank you so much, Eunice, for sharing your valuable time with us. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org.